start uh, this uh, defense. And first I will uh, present all the members of uh, the jury. And uh, I have some colleagues in a remote way. Uh, so uh, first I will present uh, Florent Nolo, professor at uh, URCA, Christic uh, UFR SEN. And then uh, Francis Rousseau, professor also at URCA, Christic UFR SEN. Uh, the co-supervisor of uh, the PhD students, and finally, Clément Duhab, doctor, at EFT Paul University, Léonard de Vinci, who is also co-supervisor of uh, this work. The rest of the jury is uh, Mrs. Samia Boukir, professor at uh, Institut Polytechnique de Bordeaux, and who is a reviewer of uh, this work. Uh, Mr. Frederick Foll Lemery, professor at Goldsmiths, University of London, and who is also a uh, reviewer of his uh, work. Uh, mi uh, and Mr. Sunu Engineer, doctor from uh, India. Yes. And I, Marie-Hélène Abel, professor at University of Technology of Compiègne. We have uh, also one colleague who is a member of the jury, but who is not uh, here today, Mrs. Céline Udelot from Mix Laboratory, Central Supélec. So, uh, Ilyas, you have uh, 40, 45 minutes to present your work. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the kind introduction. So, uh, j just before starting, starting this presentation, um, uh, just for the member of the, the jury that, that are in uh, remote, um, there is actually two links, the Zoom link and the YouTube one. And you can stay on the Zoom on the entire session. So there is no need to go back and forth. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that be before beginning. So I'm ready to start the presentation. Thank you. So I'm glad you are all here to attend to my thesis defense on AI-assisted creative expression, a case for automatic line articulation. So I start this presentation with a brief introduction of the subject. I'll then give you some insights and background on the, the, the field of deep learning so we can all understand uh, on the same basis. And then I'll move on to the motivation of the topic. I'll then discuss about our contributions in the field. And finally, I will conclude with a brief summary of all those contributions. And I will end this presentation by a brief uh, summary of some miscellaneous work that I've done uh, in the field. So let's start with the introduction. So um, in a, a digital illustration workflow settings, uh, the artist uh, produces a work in the following steps, so the three steps. The first one is called sketching. The artist produces a, a, a rough version of its first idea in order to lay down its first intent. Then uh, he, he, uh, he performs what, he, what is called inking, where he refines this idea into what we call a line art. That is a black, a black and white image with only the main uh, uh, lines of the subject. And finally, colorization where the artist adds color, texture, and shadow to the illustration in order to convey the emotion. And so the task we are interested in is called automatic line art colorization. It consists of the following setup. We are given a line art, and we want to produce what we call a, a semi-automated or an automated pipeline that can be guided or not by the user in order to produce a colored final illustration. And this task can be split up into two uh, kind of uh, area of research what we call top-down approaches, where the user defined uh, handmade algorithms that can be used for generation, and then bottom-up approaches, which are based on uh, pattern recognition. And uh, we've picked the latter because uh, like some of uh, the work that have been done on the field uh, is using deep learning, and deep learning is currently uh, at the top of the benchmark for the task of image generation. And also because we are currently witnessing the deep learning revolution. So this simple and yet bold idea from Frank Rosenblatt in 1957 of building a parameterized computer from which uh, intelligence could emerge has led to a series of work in the field of deep learning, the study of what we call neural networks. And this has snowballed into a series of uh, publications. Uh, for example, Lenet from, uh, from uh, Yann Lequin or AlexNet from uh, Jeffrey Hinton and uh, ChatGPT from OpenAI. And all those work have impact in the entire field of computer science with impact in applications such as medicine, finance, automation, and whatnot. And automatic line art is not an exception. So now I would like to step back 
and take the time uh, to teach you about deep learning so you can all understand to the best of your abilities. So in machine learning and deep learning, we are given a data set, a pair of input and output, x and y. And our objective is to find what we call a parameterized function that is parameterized by some parameter theta. And our objective is to find the function that enables uh, us to map x from, uh, to y. And the big difference, the major difference between deep learning and machine learning is that in deep learning, we are, we are using a large set of parameters, uh, usually now in the order of billions. The most fundamental brick of uh, deep learning, of neural networks, is called the perceptron. It was introduced by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957 as a simplified model of the biological neuron. So uh, it, it takes a weighted sum of its input, and if the signal is strong enough, it will activate using what we call an activation function, the sigma here. So from a linear algebraic state point, it can be viewed as a linear transformation followed by a nonlinear transformation. So now let's see the perception in action with a simple example. So here is a, classifi a binary classification problem, the end table. And as you can see here, a single line is able to separate the problem, right? And this is uh, the same case for an OR table. These are classified into linear separable problems. And this is actually what a perception is doing. It, it is learning this line, and we'll see what learning means later. But when it comes to non-linear separable problems, such as the XR problem, a single line cannot split uh, both classes. We need a second one, right? And how do we add second lines uh, in neural networks? Well, we, create, we can grow neural networks in two ways. The first one is by making it wider, so we add a neuron in the same layer. And the second, one, the second way is to make it deeper, so scale it horizontally, so we add layers of neurons. And still, from a linear algebraic standpoint, it can be viewed as a succession of linear transformation and nonlinearities. So now let's see it in action with a more complex example of binary class classification. So let's focus on the left image. So this is uh, how we can view the interpret the neural network when we grow it wider. So for example, if we add neurons in uh, one layer, it is equivalent to folding the space. But between each fold, we do not keep the fold. And for this task, actually for this example, we need six neurons in order to solve the problem. Whereas, where, where, we, where, where we grow the neural network deeper, so we add layers in between, it is equivalent to keeping the folds in between. So it is able to learn, learn more, com more complex combination of uh, the feature space. And so here in this example, we can see that we need only three fold in order to solve the problem. So this is why we prefer uh, partially to grow the neural, the neural network deeper, hence the word uh, deep learning. Now let's see how we can train, so the word learning, how we can train such neural network. So most of the time in supervised setting, we are given a data set uh, with pair X and Y. We make our first prediction, the Y hat. Given the true labels, we then compute what we call a loss. So this is the difference between the prediction and the target. And our main objective is to minimize this loss given the set of parameters that makes the model. So here, W and theta are the same thing. Okay. And our objective is to find the set of parameters theta that can solve this problem, so that can minimize the loss. So here is a simple example with a one-weight neural network and a simple loss that is just the Euclidean distance between the target and the uh, uh, prediction. And so in order to solve this, we are using a simple yet efficient algorithm that is called gradient descent. And it consists of starting from a random location, we then compute the gradient at this location, and then follow the negative direction of uh, the gradient in, a, in a, an iterative fashion. Here is in action, here it is in action with a more complex example with two neurons. So the problem scales up with the number of neurons and the dimensionality, the dimensionality uh, of the problem. The state of deep learning hasn't changed a lot since. It consists in three major steps. The first one is defining a topological uh, architectures of neural networks, so an arrangement of those neurons. The second one consists in defining what we call objective function, the function that we want to minimize. It may, it may be a mixture of those functions. And finally, the op defining the optimizer, the actual algorithm that is going to uh, use the architecture in, or, uh, uh, in order to minimize the, the function. Okay, so now I would like to uh, move on to, uh, architecture to architecture that are specialized for the task of image generation. And one of them is the autoencoder, AE. It consists of a two-part neural network. An encoder that takes an input signal and that compresses it 
into what we call a latent space, so a space of smaller dimension. And the latent code, Z, so the variable that is in this latent space, is then used to be uncompressed, to be decoded by what we call a decoder, in order to find the signal back, so to reconstruct it. So the objective function that we are minimizing this time is called the reconstruction loss. It is just the difference between the actual uh, reconstructed signal and the original one. And so it, com it, it comes down to, uh, like, because of this setup, the latent space is self-organizing into se uh, semantic information that are relevant for reconstruction, right? Because it is constrained to use, like, minimal dimension, it will uh, uh, make so efficiently. So uh, they are, they are go only uh, going to keep the information, the, uh, the important information that are present in the original signal in order to be able to reconstruct it. A second type of uh, neural network that is famous uh, for image generation is the GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. And it has been introduced by uh, Jan Goodfellow in 2014 and has led the benchmark of ima image generation since, uh, until uh, 2021, so recently. So it consists, again, of a two-part neural network. We have a first network that is called the generator. It will take a, a latent code and then generate what we call a fake image, so an image that is uh, generated. Then we have the discriminator, a network that is trained to discriminate between the fake image, so the one that were generated, and the ones from the uh, real data distribution, so from the training set. And their objective is to minimize, uh, in, by playing a, what we call a zero-sum ga game, to minimize the same objective, which is the following. So the discriminator is going to minimize this objective while the generator is going to maximize it. And basically, our objective as a trainer of such models is to make the generator fool the discriminator so it can produce images that are uh, highly uh, uh, like the images from the training set. And in this setup, there is actually an issue. So the vanilla formulation, in the vanilla formulation, there are two types of issues. The first one is uh, leading to what we call gradient vanish vanishing gradient and exploding gradient. So where the gradient uh, doesn't contain the information or erase the information that is useful for training the network. And it comes when the discriminator is becoming too strong for the generator. There is no positive signal to send to uh, the uh, generator. And the, on the other side, there is another issue that is called mod collapse. In fact, the generator can find a trick that always fools the discriminator. And it will keep generating the same trick over and over again. So we, we, we won't be able to generate other type of images. And so the research has come up with uh, ideas in order to solve this issue. And one of them is called the Wasserstein GAN with gradient penalty. So we have a similar setup with, a two, with two network. The first one is the generator. And this time, the discriminator is replaced by what we call a critic network. So the critic network, we score the quality of the generated image. So zero if it's close to the uh, actual training data, and <coughs> otherwise if it's not. And so um, researchers have found that uh, they can use this formulation of the Wasserstein distance. And I will explain what is the Wasserstein distance afterward. Um, they uh, use a surrogate loss that uh, actually minimizes this objective. And the, this formulation of the Wasserstein problem comes with uh, an issue. We have to keep the weight of the critics small during the entire training. So we have to impose what we call a, a constraint that is a, a Lipschitz constraint. So it means that the weight of the network has to uh, stay small during the entire training. So there is a loss that's called gradient penalty and then pen that penalizes uh, the, the network for those behaviors. Okay, so and we are, uh, our work is actually based uh, mainly on this architecture. Okay, so to s just give you an insight of what the Wasserstein distance is, it is a measure of distance between two distributions. And actually, let's take a simple example to illustrate that. If I asked you to measure the distance between France and the USA, how would you do it? Maybe you would take like, the distance between Paris and Washington DC, or maybe the very center of both countries. But it's quite a difficult, a difficult question, right? And so the Wasserstein distance is actually the most optimal plan that allows us to transform the land of France into the land of the USA. So this, this can be illustrated uh, like that. And so again, our work is based uh, uh, entire, uh, mostly on this architecture. So now, uh, let's go into the motivation of our work. So I would like to, to briefly talk about the challenges of the task of automatic anime line art colorization. First, let's compare a grayscale image to a line art. And as you can see, the line art is missing some valuable information that we call semantic information. It doesn't come uh, with texture nor lighting information. So the task is even more difficult. And so in this uh, area of research, we would like to solve the following problem. 
First, we would like to capture the semantic information that is missing. Secondly, we would like also to capture the, the intent of the user that wants to colorize uh, the, the image in a specific way. Secondly, we would like to make our methods uh, generate shades and texture. We also want to do it in a semi-supervised way, and we'll see why later. And finally, we want to enable a collaboration with the machine during this entire process. So here is a brief state of the art of uh, the, the actual domain. So here is a work from Zeng et al, where they successfully trained a GAN, so the architecture that we, we've discussed about earlier, uh, to colorize grayscale images. So here is a grayscale image. Then we have the heat map. So these are color dots that are provided by the user in order to, uh, uh, to give the insight uh, of the, uh, to the network. And then uh, in the middle, we have the generated image. And on the far right, we have two other examples of, uh, that are applied with other uh, hints. And so CNL in 2018 has successfully applied this kind of work to the field of anime line art colorization. And they solved the actual semantic issue by inferring a second network that is a feature extractor and that was trained to extract features out of illustration. And so they are conditioning the network on those information in order to solve this problem. But there is actually a catch. We've evaluated this method on three simple tasks. The first one consists of coloring a simple circle using no guidance from the user. The second one consists in uh, coloring the image given messy inputs. You can see that uh, in this case, the actual lines are overlapping with the, the circle, right? And in the last setup, uh, we, tr we uh, evaluate for interpolation, so the ability of the network to build uh, gradients between colors. And in the three cases, their network is not able to solve the, the problem correctly. So there are major issues uh, in this work that we want to solve in our contributions. So now let's move on to the contributions. So first, in order to train a neural network to solve such a task, we need a data set, right? And there is an issue in this area of research. There is no public data set that is available and that contains enough line art and illustration pairs. So we have to build them uh, synthetically. So in order to do so, we scrape uh, images from, the, uh, from online and we are uh, using the fair use in order to be able to use it for research. So this work cannot be applied in the same setting for uh, industrial application. And so there is an issue with the typical data set that they are using. Here is a, uh, an example of such a data set that is called Danboru. And as you can see, there are issues with the images. They are not consistent. They are images uh, of different natures. They are photographs, images of landscape, of characters, uh, and whatnot. And we wanted to solve this because it is known in machine learning that the cleaner your data set is, the better your model will be. And so in this uh, sense, we scrapped a data set of images from uh, Pixiv, which is a website that cat uh, categorizes uh, such kind of images. And we've manually filtered it using some incentive, uh, some uh, subjective uh, metrics. And we've uh, optimized it, filtered it manually, sorry, uh, for being consistent, both in terms of quality, but also in terms of the nature of the images. And by doing so, we, we kept only, like just to give you an insight, we kept only 30% of the images that we craft. And it comes down to a data set of 22,000 images for training, and we've kept 3,000 for testing. Concerning the synthetic line art generation, uh, we've used what, we, what is called the extended difference of Gaussian. It is basically a complex uh, um, edge detector. And when combined with a threshold function, it is enough in order to come up with a, a line art that can be used for such a task. So now let's move on to our first contribution, paint storage. The objective of these cont contributions are the following. We want to reduce the misconduct of the network. So we want to make the network follow the instructions of the user. We also want to improve the hint generation because as we've seen previously, they are using like uh, random pixels that are activated in order to give the insight on the network. And we have shown in our work that this is not enough because when it is used by the user, the user will actually use like real strokes so it won't be like just dots. And so this, this is one of the reasons why their work were, wasn't uh, robust to the messy inputs. And overall, we also want to improve the uh, generated quality. So here is a summary uh, of uh, our work. So first, we can see the typical uh, uh, GAN setup where we have a generator that takes a line art and that we condition on uh, user stroke that are generated by, uh, by our method. And then we can see the discriminator that is used for the adversarial training. We also introduce a second generator 
that is used to provide consistency in the signal. So this generator is trained to produce the signal that was passed to the first network. Secondly, we also introduce another network that is called a feature, uh, uh, that, that is a feature jet detector. And we are using the features of this detector in order to uh, bridge the difference between the generated illustration and the original one. And secondly, similarly to previous work from CNL, we are using a feature extractor that is called illustration to vec and that was trained to tag images of illustrations. And we are using uh, one of the, the features that is learned by this model in order to give feedback to our network. Here is a zoom into the architecture of a network. So our network, our network to summarize it, um, it is a convolutional neural network. So it is learning filters out of the training data. And it is organized into what we call a unit architecture. So we have first the encoder, like from the auto encoder setup, right? And the encoder part. And both are connected using what we call residual, residual connection. And this is used in order to uh, not solve, but mitigate the impact of exploding and uh, vanishing radiance. And we are also using a custom block, and I won't have the time to dive in, but custom block that I use for performance, because we want our, our, our method to be interactive. So we want to work at interactive rates in the order of 15 FPS at least. So uh, something like 30 milliseconds or, or so. So in order to prove that our work uh, is in some cases better than others, or to compare it with other work, we have to build what we call evaluations. And so we distinguish between uh, two types of uh, evaluation when it comes to image uh, differences. Objective metrics, that uses mathematical formulation of the distances between two images. And we can, again, split it into two categories, what we call content variant losses, that are often applied in settings where there is no one answer to a problem. And actually, this is our case, because when we are given a line art and a set of uh, hints, these are, these are not hints, not the full intent, so we can come up with multiple solutions to the problem. And in this area, we've picked uh, what, what is called the FID metric. And I will talk about it uh, later. Then there is the content invariant losses metrics. And that are often applied in a supervised uh, field where we know the, the actual right answer. And finally, we are talking about art. And evaluating art is a subjective matter. So we need human in order to evaluate this process. And so we've used the MOS evaluation. This, uh, this is called the uh, mean opinion score, and we'll talk about uh, afterwards. So concerning the first type of evaluation, the FID metric, it is actually uh, utilizing the um, features that are learned by a pre-trained network that is called Inception. And we are comparing those features that, are, that has been shown to be similar to what the uh, visual cortex of a cat is actually uh, um, uh, building when uh, looking at, the, uh, at an image. And we are measuring the difference between uh, those features. And it comes up with a score. And here is the score in action. When we, uh, come, we uh, add uh, noise to the image, so when we change the image, the score goes up. So it means that uh, FID that is close to zero is a good FID. The, the images are similar. And so we've evaluated uh, our work against state of the art using this metric. And as you can see, uh, our model is able to, uh, beat, uh, to, like, to improve previous work. Concerning the LPIPs, so the learned patch similarity, uh, learned perceptual patch similarity, this time this is a content variant loss. So most of the time it is used uh, for measuring uh, supervised learning uh, uh, approaches. And uh, because of the state of the art is, is a benchmarking on this metric, we also have to uh, uh, measure it. And so basically th this is the same idea as the FID, but instead of being applied on the entire image, it is applied on patches of, uh, of the image and then average into a single metric. And they have shown uh, through human evaluation that their metric is closer to human perception than previous techniques such as the, S uh, the SSC in PSNR or MSE. We have also evaluated our work, uh, sorry, I've missed. Uh, so we've evaluated our work with this metric. And as you can see, we somewhat, in some cases, we've improved upon previous work. Uh, but, uh, and, but the results are mitigated. But th this comes down to the fact that this metric is for constant variant problems. So this may, this may uh, give us insight uh, on that uh, problem. Finally, we evaluate also on the subjective metric, the mean opinion score. It was introduced in uh, telecommunication uh, signal differences. So they ask user to rate the signal from one to five, on a scale to, uh, from one to five. One being, being bad and five excellent. So we've used the same metric. And actually, it, uh, they have shown in studies uh, that humans tend to avoid the extremums. So the real metric is between uh, two and four. 
And they have also sh shown that a point for improvement is a perceptual quality difference uh, between the, uh, the things that we are comparing. And so uh, it shows that uh, our work uh, improved upon, uh, upon state of the art. Okay, so let's see some results uh, of our work. So here you can see uh, our work in action. We have built a custom web application where the, the model, the method is deployed. And actually the user provide a line art, the network comes up with the first colorization, and then the user can add strokes in order to give hints to the network. And the network tries to follow the instruction in order to colorize the illustration. Here are some other results that we've obtained. On the left, we have the line art, and on the middle, the hint map that is used, and on the right, the generated outcome. Here is another example where I personally tried, I took, actually, I took uh, one sample of the test set. I've uh, created a line art out of the X dot method. I then hint the model with some input, and this is the generated output of the model. And then I manually refined uh, the generated outcome in order to produce the final illustration. So I removed the artifacts, as we will see later, and then I refined uh, the colorization. So this uh, is to show how it can be integrated into an uh, artist workflow. Then we evaluated our work against the limitations of the previous one. And in the three scenarios, our network is able to cope uh, with the tasks. And on the right, you can see uh, like a more complex example that exhibits such behaviors. On the top, we have Payne's Shainer, a previous work, and on the bottom, uh, our approach. However, our approach is not exempted from limitation. There is actually artifacts, and this can be explained by the, the use of convolutions, and maybe we'll have time to discuss it in, in the discussion section. Then we we'll move on to our second contribution. We want to improve upon this work, this work. And one of the main limitations is that all the previous work are a one-time process. We only, we replace actually the artist, right? We input a line art, it comes up with an illustration. But our objective, as a reminder, is to create a collaboration between the artist and the machine. So we want to reintroduce it. And uh, to do it, we've reframed the problem of colorization as an in-painting problem. It means that the network will not le learn to colorize the entire image, but just a portion of it, given like a out, uh, outer context. We also want generally to improve our hints generation process because we've learned from our previous work and actually uh, we, we, we saw that the user are actually pointing colors that are generally uh, gravitating towards the mean of the color of the region. So it is exempted from lighting, texture and those kind of information. And secondly, we wanted to explore the use of what we call curriculum learning where we progressively uh, increase the difficulty of the training in order to help the network learn. So here is the, hint, the new hint generated, uh, generated process. So we start with uh, an illustration, right? Then we applied XDOG in order to extract the line art. Secondly, we trained a displacement network that is trained to come up with a segmentation masks for semantic regions that are similar. We then, then limit the number of segments uh, using quantization and k-mint in order to come with a discrete set of colors. And then, instead of using the original illustration to produce our hints, we are using this quantized version of the, of the process. We then use the same region in order to generate random masks that can describe the, the region that the network has to colorize. So here, we come up with a, a composite of uh, all those uh, images. So the network will only focus on colorizing uh, this area based on the, the outer layers. Here is our architecture. As you can see, it is similar to Paintorch, but we've added an external guide network that is actually used when we are performing curriculum learning. We again compare our approach to other work using the same, the same three metrics. On the first one, uh, yes, and also we uh, also uh, did an ablation study where we tried to uh, cut off some part of the network in order to see their, their, their implication, because maybe some of our choices were, were not uh, relevant. And so, uh, as we can see, like in average, it improved uh, upon previous work on the FID. On the LPIPs, it improved a little bit, but it is still mitigated because of what we talked about uh, earlier, because it is, it is a content invariant uh, metric. And then we also conducted an MOS study again. And we can see that this time we improved by uh, more than a 0.4 margin. So it means that there is uh, certainly a perceptual difference. Again. We've also uh, built a custom web application where we deploy the model. So in the, first, uh, in the left canvas, the user provides a mask. On the middle one, it provides hints. And the right one uh, is the generated output. 
Here are some results that are obtained with this method. Here is the line art, the mask again, the hint maps, and the generated outcome. I've also evaluated um, the impact of the number of strokes on the generated output. And as we can see, without any hints, our network tends to provide a gray uh, scale uh, colorization. And the more we increase the number of strokes, the better it becomes. Finally, we wanted to evaluate the iterative process, right? And we found that there is an emergent workflow that arises from uh, our method. In the first scenario, um, the network uh, proposed a first colorization. It can then be refined by passing again to our network, but this time by providing uh, another mask. In the second scenario, we wanted to see if it can use the actual outer context of the image in order to be used for the colorization. And we can see that provided the more complex images with shadow information and lighting, our network is able to keep the lighting in the uh, actual output illustration. But again, it comes up with the uh, limitations. Our network is uh, uh, programmed to be used in iterative fashion. And when we are using it in one pass only, it is not necessarily better than previous work. So uh, here is a work from uh, Paint in 2017. Here is our previous work, Paint Storch, that improved the quality of the overall colorization. And here is our network that is used in a context that were not uh, um, uh, provided at the beginning, a one-time one -time process. And we can see that even though the colors are cleaner because of the mask, uh, it is not able to come up with high, um, um, high frequency details. At this time of our work, a new type of model arises uh, from the competition. These models are called Denoising Diffusion Probabilistic Model, DDPM. And here is how it works. So first, we start with an illustration or a photograph. And we pro progressively add Gaussian noise on top of it. And for a certain amount of steps, usually in the order of thousands or four thousands, at the end, the final result is a noisy, uh, noisy sample. It is a Gaussian distribution. And the objective with this method is to come up with a network that is able to learn the noise that was added at each step. And so uh, it has been proven by papers in 2021 that in, in certain cases it can beat the GAN at image generation. So here, is it, uh, here it is uh, in action with a simple example. Here we have a simple mixture of two Gaussians. We progressively add noise on top of it. So we, make it, we turn it into a Gaussian distribution, like a single one. Right? This uh, pass is called the, f the forward diffusion process. And then we want to trace back uh, the, the information in order to uh, find our origin signal. This is called the backward diffusion process. And there is actually a catch with such, uh, such methods. Well, it can produce, uh, it has been shown to produce better images than GANs, but actually it is slower. And we are in a work where we need the actual interaction with the, the network. And so uh, researchers have tried to come up with solutions in order to uh, limit the number of steps, but also the way we are generating uh, those, uh, with those kind of models. And one of those is called the latent denoising diffusion model. So this time, instead of working into image space, they first train an autoencoder that is uh, on, the, on the left. So the architecture that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. They train it to compress the information down to a smaller space. But this time, this is not as compressed as before. This is a space that is still in image space. But for example, it would be a 4x4 image with 512 channels, for example. Okay? And so they train the denoising diffusion model in this space instead of the entire image space. So the problem is a lot uh, easier and smaller. So it can be make, made faster. And so we wanted to explore uh, the use of such model in our new work, Stable Paint, for which the objective are the following. We wanted to see how we can condition such network on user input. We also, but, uh, uh, as previous work, improved, uh, wanted to improve the hints generation process. And finally, because those models are known to be better than GAN, we wanted to see if it can be applied to uh, such a uh, uh, task. So before diving into the model, uh, let's dive into the hint generation process. So it has been shown that using the method that we've uh, uh, introduced in uh, uh, Stencil Torch, that we can separate the uh, illumination from the radiance, so here. So we can separate basically the colors from the, uh, the uh, light information. And so we are now using it in order to uh, generate the hints. And here on the left, you can see the implication of the metric that is used to uh, smooth the image, that is the L1 smoothing method. And the more we increase the smoothing, the less information there is uh, in the origin, original image. So this is again something that has to be tuned uh, for the problem. 
And so we've explored the use of a latent diffusion, denoising diffusion model for the task of automatic colorization. And here is uh, our approach. So the schematic is exactly the same as the latent uh, diffusion problem, at the exception that this time we've trained two autoencoders. The first one in order to uh, compress the images into a latent space, and the second one where we reuse the decoder of the first one, we freeze it. It means that it won't, it won't be trained uh, in the second step. And we train only an encoder that takes a line art and that put it uh, into the latent space of the uh, illustration. And so then we train the denoising diffusion model uh, conditioned on uh, the Schintz inputs. And here are some pre preliminary results that we've obtained. So because this is a, a model that is hard to train, we need a lot of data, a lot of computes. Uh, we've limited this work to images that are uh, 128 by, by 128. And so uh, these are pre pre preliminary results. And we can already see that some behavior uh, are coming up. So for example, some illustration exhibits some shadow information and such kind of things. There is also a lot more variety than we, what we can obtain with the GAN. But certainly because of the uh, limited uh, size of the uh, hint map, it is not able um, to cope with the user intent. So here is a brief conclusion of our work. We first introduced paint storage in order to provide uh, user guidance, then stencil torch in order to uh, make uh, um, like inter interaction with the machine, so to introduce collaboration with the machine. And we finally explore uh, such approaches to the, the, the new kind of model that appear, that is the DDPM models. Note that um, from an application perspective, when training such model, uh, it is costly, both in terms of compute and money. So one iteration that may not be conclusive um, take, took us like about one week on a single machine that cost like 50, uh, $50,000. So it is hard to scale. Here are some perspectives on future work. We would like to use this new model, uh, this new approach that came out recently that is called control, control, control net and that successfully shown how to uh, uh, co condition the deep, neural, deep uh, uh, denoising diffusion model. We would like then to use the method that we've introduced to separate the color information from the lighting in order to provide insight on the lighting. So a new way to control the actual output where we could control the direction of the light, for example. And finally, we would like to conduct more thorough evaluation, uh, taking inspiration from the field of human computer interaction uh, where I do not come from. Finally, I would like to end this presentation on some mis miscellaneous work that I have, uh, I have done on the, um, the general topic of deep learning. So during my PhD, I was able to work on a project called Magic Wall, where I applied what is called side transfer uh, to uh, an image. So it takes the uh, actual, uh, actual piece of art from an artist, and it applies the style of the art onto a camera feed. And it was deployed in an art gallery. Then I work also on audio-driven mouth animation, where I explore uh, the task of uh, building a 3D mesh out of a single image of a person and then control it using only uh, audio signal in order to add uh, uh, life to a personal assistance, for example. I've worked also on a distant earth, a project where I try to apply um, uh, insight from uh, computer graphics, uh, such as um, um, spatialization, uh, structure acceleration with spatialization, in order to uh, train a neural radiance field. So this is a network that is trained to come up with novel view out of a, sing uh, of a uh, simple set of predefined views. I've been working also on tiny networks that can be embedded in order, for example, to solve uh, the task of um, tracking balls in a pool game. And finally, I, had, uh, I also explored the use of latent audio space and exploration in order to provide uh, for meditation purposes. So I hope I've successfully um, uh, discussed the extent of our contribution, and I'm now ready for the question. Thank you. Presentation. It's the first time uh, the public, uh, the audience applause uh, before uh, the question of a jury, <laughs> but uh, we will not be influenced by your applause. <laughs> yeah, it, it is not usual to uh, applaud. Uh. Uh, thank you for uh, respecting the time, and well. it's now time to questions, and I will give uh, the first uh, talk 
to the reviewer and uh, first uh, Mrs. Samia Boukir. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Elias, for your uh, excellent presentation. I um, was really impressed and I thank can you. understand why the, the audience uh, applauded. Very, very good uh, presentation, very well illustrated, so very thank interesting. You. Um, I, um, I really liked your work, very interesting, the work, the whole work. Uh, you worked on a very uh, difficult uh, task and uh, the solution you came up uh, with were uh, convincing, at least <laughs> from uh, in deep learning, all yeah. the solutions, architectures you came up with were convincing and gave uh, excellent results. Thanks. Um, however, I can, uh, there are some weak points I found. Uh, your report wa was, um, your dissertation was really very good, especially um, uh, the chapter on related work. This one was really very, very well uh, documented and Thank very uh, well written. Uh, however, I feel that uh, you, you were, <laughs> you ran out of time because, for example, there are two parts who, which are important for uh, a, a, a PhD thesis. Yep. It's the abstract. And the conclusion, uh, they were uh, too short. <laughs> I think you were just running out of time yeah. because you're very good in writing. You don't have problems in this, but uh, uh, at least for the conclusion and pers pers perspective, future work, uh, we got things, <laughs> we got better um, uh, insight with uh, your presentation, but I, I didn't see yet your last version of uh, the dissertation. Yeah. I hope you uh, developed more the, um, uh, the conclusion, which is really very important, and also I think the abstract should be uh, more developed more thorough. because okay. many people read only the abstract and the con conclusion. So uh, you should, I think, you should improve this. Uh, this two okay, maybe so they are already improved, I guess, yeah. for the last version. Yeah. So I, um, I work on this, and I will uh, resend the uh, the actual documents. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, uh, another weak point because uh, your work is excellent in deep learning. Yep. Uh, I feel that uh, your work is, of course, multidisciplinary, uh, and um, you didn't um, pay much in, uh, attention to the other parts of your work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more um, the task is uh, um, from com computer vision, computer graphics, image processing yep. task, and you didn't, maybe you didn't have time, I guess. So <laughs> your um, contribution is much more on the deep learning side. But um, I think if you paid more attention to uh, the other uh, disciplines of your uh, work, yep. you can even get better results in general. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, maybe I can give you, give you some insight uh, on this. So uh, as yes. you saw certainly with the, the mission and work, um, I've worked on uh, multiple subjects uh, at the same time. And at the end, I picked uh, one that uh, uh, had the, the better uh, uh, like vision, let's say. And uh, yeah, and also, uh, Actually, uh, I come up from two fields. So I've worked on artificial intelligence, but I also work on uh, computer graphics. So yes. I, I'm aware there are other techniques. And uh, yeah, I didn't ha have the time to explore like uh, all the possibilities. And yeah, may maybe that can be viewed as a weakness of the work. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> you can do everything. But because I, I, di I worked on computer vision and yeah. I know very, quite well the, 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 uh, the techniques used, so I feel that you can improve really your result okay. by using more advanced, more sophisticated think techniques in, in uh, um, um, for example, for edge, edge detection or for uh, uh, pattern recognition and th this kind of things. But I yeah. know it's not the core of your work, so. Um, yeah, but I, I do agree with you, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So um, well, what I have. When I read your uh, your thesis, I had uh, noted some some remarks. So I have some. Yep. Um, I just have a look at what what I I put on my notes when I read your thesis. Um, yes, I had one one um, one comment on uh, mm -hmm. when you said when you did um, uh, you extract um, um, synthetic line art using yeah. an edge detector. To me, it's not synthetic because you, it's an edge detection. Yeah. You, did, you extracted real edges from a real image. So to me, it's not synthetic. So yeah. you should use another term. OK, so maybe well, well, I would uh, rephrase it. But uh, the synthetic concerned uh, like the pipeline, not the, 
Like, it it does, not, does not describe the technique. Because uh, right. what, what I mean, the difference between synthetic and real, is that it is provided by, the, by a human. It is already all right, uh, because provided. Because to me, yeah. synthetic, I, I had another <laughs> reading of the, the, the term. So, all right. Yeah. OK. Um, let me see what I have. Uh, I think, yes, I had um, quite a few qu questions. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question is about um, um, the, the, the date, that data curation, uh, yeah. curing. I don't remem remember how to say that. that uh, yeah, it's cleaning. fine. Curation, it's fine. <laughs> curation, we say. Sorry for my English. is not um, um yeah, you did uh, you did it manually. Everything yeah. is uh, automated. So I was wondering. I know it's very difficult because there is a, an artistic part of this uh, yeah. on this data. But for example, I think you you maybe you you could uh, have done it uh, um, automatically by uh, image yeah. indexing. For example, at least <clears throat> to to remove uh, um, um, images which have not. Um, just um, um, not about the consistency of the images, but at least for uh, the image yeah. nature. Mm. Why you didn't use? A... And actually, this is fun that you you, you come up with uh, this question, uh, because well, uh, I know that I, I didn't take the time uh, to put it into the essay, but actually uh, I did it manually uh, on some parts, and some others are actually automated uh, some part of it. So for example, I've built uh, like pipelines to. Uh, detect like, for example, black uh, and white images from colored ones, uh, some that are too noisy, uh, that can, could remove, for example, landscape or this kind of stuff. Uh, and also I uh, filtered on the shape of the uh, illustration. And I also trained a simple uh, uh, algorithm, uh, neural network based on my preferences uh, of uh, like what I call qualitative illustration in order to uh, semi-automatically uh, reduce the number of images. Because uh, I didn't put the, the entire numbers, but there were like, uh, in the order of 2,000, uh, 200 and uh, of thousand of images. So yeah, it <laughs> and I did it All in right. one weekend. <laughs> you should have put it because I was wondering, everything yeah. is automated and this thing he didn't try to- To uh, automatize, yeah. Because it was about 20,000, if I remember. Yeah. 20,000 images you have to filter manually. It looks, it looks a bit- uh, Yeah, so I, I will add this uh, in the final essay. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, regarding the, I have, I think, um, let me just check. Um, about this this data, um, yes, I was wondering um, because you said uh, that the diversity of the the, the training data is very yeah. important. Um, so, how can you measure the diversity of the training data? Is there yeah. any measure to for for uh, the diversity or? Uh... Yeah. So uh, I did not come with a uh, uh, like diverse uh, diversity metrics uh, for this data, but. Um, uh, yeah, actually, it is quite hard to, to define, but uh, I did not add such a metric. Um, just to give you some insight of the building of the data set. So um, I've, there is actually biases in the data set because uh, I took data from certain communities that are producing this type of art. And there are some biases that are, uh, did not uh, took the time to talk about, such as, for example, uh, you may have seen that uh, in the colorization, uh, most of the time it is past using pastel colors. And because like a lot of images were actually uh, with the, like there, is, there were more skin than the closet, for example. Yeah, so let's say it like that. Uh, so I, I preferred, uh, so I choose to actually uh, filter for such kind of uh, behaviors. But yeah, they, uh, I did not measure the diversity. Actually, um, some of them may be of the same character, for example, but yeah. So, uh, and how I would do it, uh, see if I had to do so, for example, I would, for example, train a, a detector on the uh, characters that was drawn, for example, in illustration. Because uh, on the website that I scraped, uh, there are tags uh, associated with it. So I can do like a, a statistic analysis of uh, those metrics. But yeah, I, I did not, my bad. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was not asking, I knew you didn't measure the diversity. Yeah. My question was, uh, are there measure, existing measures of, of diversity? That, oh, that was okay. my, my question. Okay, sorry. Because it looks, it looks not uh, obvious. It, w yeah. it looks difficult. Uh, it would need to, yeah. I, I would need to, to look into uh, the community of uh, like a data set and this kind of thing. I'm sure there are, there are metrics, but I, I have not studied, the, studied them. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, um, regarding the data, yep. um, you said that some uh, the data are biased uh, because you have a lot of uh, uh, feminine characters, and then yeah. you have the skin, the skin which is um, which is biasing the, the the color the colorization. 
Um, my question is why you, you didn't try to do data balancing. Um, okay, so and then you can you can uh, alleviate this yeah. problem. So uh, I, I have maybe like I can give you a part of the answer. Uh, the main part of it is because if I remove those images. Uh, or, or if I balance uh, balance it, uh, actually, it's quite hard because uh, yes, if I balance it, it's quite hard uh, because uh, uh, I, I cannot be sure of uh, like how many images. So it would actually take time uh, to discriminate between those kind of images in order to come up with some kind of statistics that can be used to uh, uh, like uh, weight the importance of uh, each uh, kind yeah. of uh, images, right? And uh, I forgot the point, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I was telling you why you didn't try to use da data balancing yeah. to, to alleviate the bias due to the skin, I mean, the presence of too much skin on the yeah. images. And uh, there is, uh, so there is also a second reason, is that um, there is a reason, uh, reason why uh, those data sets are biased. It's because the community is biased. And so I, and I'm targeting this community. So unfortunately, I have to kind of keep the, the balance, ah. uh, like the, the actual biases, right? And, yes. But yeah, if I if I wanted to make like something that is a, uh, that has some kind of uh, uh, behavior that won't exhibit such kind of uh, things, effectively I could use like balancing, and I could I could for example train a classifier that detects this kind of images and use it mm -hmm. to uh, automatically label uh, such kind of images. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So it's it's uh, it's because it's an artwork, so it's not yeah. easy, I think, to. Um, uh, to, to find the right balance between uh, art and the automatic yeah. uh, and, and automatic I think uh, I could processing. I could take both passes but uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes I have uh, other questions um, regarding uh, I really liked uh, your focus uh, the, your presentation and the focus you did a focus on the on the metrics yeah I know it's very difficult but um, your results are convincing and I see uh, the difference uh, um, uh, visually, we see it, but unfortunately, yeah. my, uh, the weakness of your work is on the, the evaluation. objective, objective um, evaluation. Yeah. The, the, um, visually, th your results are really convincing, very good results. We see the difference, but that's why I said that uh, you should, uh, um, uh, you should uh, investigate the maximum of uh, uh, different uh, evaluation uh, okay. metrics uh, to uh, enhance uh, the, 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 feedback. the improvement you, you really get. But okay. the, the, the two metrics you used, especially the second one, which is... Uh, the in, LPIPs, uh, yeah. I think even both, I mean, the, the second one, I forgot the name, well, based on similarity, yes, this one. LPIPS. <laughs> this one is even, uh, I know why it's not very, um, doesn't really enhance your work, but even the other one um, like the FID? does not enhance in, uh, um, sufficiently your work. So yeah. that's why I told you maybe you should um, um, search for other metrics, more metrics uh, to enhance uh, your work. So, and I have another question on yeah. this evaluation. For You said that you didn't use the um, the signal to noise um yeah uh, psnr uh, yeah um how we say Sing signal to noise I forgot the name or rapport uh, <laughs> signal, ratio. Uh, ratio sorry ratio yes yeah. signal to noise ratio you didn't use it i'm not yeah. sure i'm not sure i then i understood why you didn't do it okay um but i think maybe it can help because okay, so your your results are good and not as noisy as the others yeah so okay, so maybe I can, be, I can give you some insight uh, on those questions. So um, first, concerning the metrics, um, so I've optimized for the metrics that are currently used in the uh, in the field, uh, and so at the time I did this work, uh, these were the metrics that was uh, optimized by the uh, um, the previous work. So I, I wanted to compare on the same things, and so the, effectively there are other metrics. For example, uh, concerning the content variance, um, so. Just to remind to a little bit of context, we want to evaluate the perceptual quality of the image. And so we are not really interested into uh, measuring, uh, for example, uh, luminance or uh, contrast or this kind of stuff, because um, mm -hmm. they do not provide like, uh, necessarily the good insight on uh, uh, what the image exhibits at the final uh, output. And so uh, I've based my choice of the metrics based on the work they have done uh, on the respective paper. And Actually, they have compared to other metrics such as the um, like PSNR or the uh, um, maybe more invariant side, the SSIM, the structure similarity. And uh, they have shown that 
uh, they do not align with uh, human perception. So it's kind of a hard topic, right, to select like the, the good metrics to optimize uh, in this field. Um, but yeah, there are, there are other metrics. And uh, uh, as I said, I, di I uh, did not necessarily invest uh, like that much uh, in uh, that area. So yeah, definitely I would l like to uh, look for other metrics that are maybe uh, more prevalent for this task. But these are the metrics that are usually uh, optimized uh, when we look at generated uh, gener image generation in the field of uh, deep learning. So, yes. yeah. Um, and also, because I really found your work very good, it's mm -hmm. not uh, um, evaluated very well to me. I mean, it doesn't yeah. show the evaluation, the objective evaluation doesn't really show the quality of your work. I was wondering why, okay. um, because in image processing, we measure the artifacts. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, because your uh, method is really improving, uh, has less artifacts than the other um, like color bleeding, like uh, the artif visual artifact, like other, the mm -hmm. other myth yeah. methods. Uh, I was wondering if the, you don't have measures. Maybe there are measures that, uh, um, metrics that measures the artifacts. Yeah, actually we could use, for example, the SSM as a, such a metric, because it, uh, like um, it is measuring some metrics that are based on the- uh, Wait again, so I didn't hear. Ah, sorry, yeah, do you, can you hear me? No, 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 I didn't hear the, the metric. Ah, the metric, it's called the SSIM. So structural, uh, structural. Uh, I, sorry, I don't remember the uh, full name, but uh, S -S -S it's, uh, oh, sorry. Just up, structural. Uh, I didn't see this one, sorry. Sorry, SSIM, I'm sorry. I up. haven't seen it on your thesis. I don't remember this one. Uh, I mentioned it, uh, I think. Yeah, so it is a, a structural similarity, yes. So, and it is a- uh, You mentioned this one? Yeah, I mentioned it, uh, I think, in the, the essay. I don't um, remember, sorry. Uh, yeah. And I, I said, the, the, uh, I justify it by uh, saying that uh, the LPIPs uh, like actually overcome uh, the, the issue of such metrics. Yeah, so yeah, there, there is a metric that can be used for uh, such kind of uh, uh, measuring. All right. Um, do I have, I still have time? Yep. No, the president, the president. Yes, 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 you have time, you can. I have time, all right. <laughs> uh, let me remember, I have other questions on your, um, that was about the evaluation. Okay. Um, I noted other things. Um, I, I think you had question about, about the uh, k-means uh, in your report, maybe? Th that's fine, because okay. uh, in gen I told you that that was, um, to me, I, I understand. Um, there are not only k-means on, on your edge detector or mm -hmm. on your uh, um, image, um, uh, on your color uh, quantization uh, or any image processing and, uh, and um, uh, pattern recognition computer graphics. To me, it's not, um, um, it's not inv the investigation is not deep enough, but I understand because you, your uh, contribution is much more on the, on the deep learning. Um, side, so it's not, it's okay for me. Okay. Uh, I have other questions uh, <coughs> about your uh, contributions. Um, yeah, about your uh, uh, um, paint torch. Uh, you use the, you use two guns. Yeah. And um, and it is inspired by, by um, another work, uh, cycle gun. Yeah. Uh, so I was just wondering what's what's the difference between uh, uh, your contribution and cycle gun because to me it's also a cycle yeah. your contribution yeah. if i understood well yeah so the, yeah th this is in fact inspired by the work from a uh, cycle gun uh, where yes. they introduced the, 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 this cycle consistency loss uh, that can uh, that allows us to do so but with uh, um, sorry i forgot my english but uh, avec le recul uh, instead of using such approach i would have rather uh, used uh, something like a, implemented a differentiable uh, extended difference of gaussian and use it to propagate the signal. Because uh, I've, uh, I've made some tests. Sorry, can you say it again? You, you are talking too fast. Ah, okay, sorry. Sorry, so, say um, it again. Uh, yeah, so, uh, avec du recul, so with uh, like, uh, oui. like uh, my feedback from now, uh, I would replace uh, this part of the, the technique where we have to train a second generator. So it, uh, it, yes. uh, it is using a lot of compute. Uh, and actually, I would, uh, I would replace it today with a differ differentiable uh, extended difference of Gaussian. So I would make the X-Dog technique that is used to produce the line art and make it differentiable so it can uh, actually come up with uh, the original signal. And um, yeah, 
And so to give you, uh, an, uh, I, I don't remember if I cited, uh, I think I added into the, the uh, bibliography the, the cycle consistency paper. But maybe I did not uh, talk about it like roughly. I don't in the, remember yeah. about this one. I just wanted to see the difference because to it's me the same idea. it was interesting. The, the, the fact you use, um, you re-inject the images that are generated as uh, for the training. I found the idea yeah. very interesting. But I was just wondering what's the difference between, because it's inspired by cycle gun. Yeah. Because to me, your work is also a cycle. Yeah, it is a cycle gun. Cycle. But uh, it would mean that uh, my network actually is a cycle Wasserstein GAN with penalty, uh, gradient penalty. But yeah, this is inspired by a cycle GAN. And so we use the same trick in order to provide the, the feedback because we, we have seen in previous work that the line art that we are uh, colorizing is kind of disappearing. And so uh, in some cases it can be fine, but in some others uh, it is not. And so this is why we wanted to uh, refine this process by, ad by adding this uh, consistency term. But yeah, it, it, it is the same thing as the cycle GAN. Yeah. All right. Uh, and I think I have just one last question about the um, um, stencil torch, yeah. uh, which is really, um, uh, if I, which is uh, really gives um, much more uh, power to the user, so the user really can control what he wanted. Yes. Um, you used um, uh, you used um, masks. Yeah. So my my question is, I think it's um, you tend to not. Um, um, uh, you don't do not enhance what your work we don't uh, your work is very good but we don't know sometimes I'm not sure I don't know what was used already what wa yeah, was okay. uh, proposed already in the in the in, in uh, um, related work what is your own work so my question is about the use of masks Okay. Uh, is it the first use or other people like used mask before? In, in the, it was the originality. Okay, so I will, I will answer this question. Uh, so um, firstly, this is not like a, a random idea. This has been used by the community in other uh, image generation processes and mainly in the task that, we, that is called like in painting or out painting, where we have like only a portion of the image uh, to colorize, right? And, but uh, in the subfield of anime line accurization, this is the first time, at least with deep learning approaches, uh, that we are using uh, masks to condition the network. Yeah. It, it's inspired from uh, in painting, but it's the first time it's used in, uh, in um, line art. Yeah, with GAN, with GAN techniques. With GAN. Like in, in uh, okay. machine learning or classical approaches, this is like a usually common uh, approach in order okay. to remove the noise from the outside. And, I, think, yeah. I think I got it, but you know, in many, many times, I think mm -hmm. if you write papers, you have to people always ask to be very clear about your contribution, what okay. exists, because I think sometimes you write too fast and we don't get the information. We are okay. not sure what, uh, what is your contribution. So I think okay. it's, it's, it's important. So I, I, I make the time, I, I'll take the time to make the separation clear in the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. sometimes uh, you write too fast thing. You should take more time on these issues because it is okay. important, especially if you send, uh, if you try to um, publish your work, it is important. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elias. Congratulations. It's a really Thank very, you. very good work. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Now I will give a talk to Professor Frédéric Foll Marie, reviewer of this uh, work. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, this this was an interesting uh, session of questions, covered some of my points. I will probably ask some of my questions will be a bit similar okay. um, and the uh, presentation was excellent uh, uh, the pace is uh, quick uh, sometimes might be good to slow down a bit um, would be preferable i would think um, and otherwise the thesis reads well very well the background as was mentioned is excellent and you're definitely working in a set of areas that are uh, very active and moving fast. Yeah. And we see this in your results as you move across different types of architectures, for example, in, in terms of deep learning. Um, and that's uh, by itself uh, a challenge for a PhD. Yeah. So uh, congratulations on uh, trying to follow uh, the wave as it keeps <laughs> moving forward. 
Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, we all we all have this kind of challenge these days, I guess. Um, so I have yeah I have a few questions. I, they may not be in a particular good order at, at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. I have some notes and then that I took during the presentation, and I have a few notes from my preliminary report. So I'll I'll try to cover these okay. essentially. Um, so since we were talking about architectures, so yeah. you you did a lot of work on uh, and, and you have, I think, a good understanding of uh, architectures be based on CNNs, which you mentioned, convolutional neural networks. Uh, you use uh, the architecture of GANs. You've, you've probably, this is the type of architecture you've explored the most. And and then you more recently uh, you've look at the uh, process of uh, diffusion embedded in uh, an architecture uh, where noise notions of noise are used for training and denoising. So um, one other architecture that has been uh, in fashion in recent years is the transformer architecture. Yes. And I didn't see that uh, really explored in, in the work, but I and I, I'm not saying you it has to be there. Uh, you've already done quite a lot, uh, but I'm curious to see what you think about it and whether this could represent a compromise uh, or not uh, okay, in terms yeah. of if you compare GAN with basic CNNs and even with uh, more recent diffusion models. Okay, so uh, in order to answer your question, maybe I, I'll take, uh, if you allow me, uh, the time to explain briefly what is the transformer architecture so everyone can understand yes. the, the extent of the question. So I've prepared a board for that extent. So up. can you see the, uh, the drawings? Thank you. Okay, yes. nice. So basically, the transformer architecture is a, a type of model that is used for sequen uh, sequential uh, uh, problems. Like, for example, uh, you have a, fr uh, a sentence, so I am, for example, A. And uh, the first uh, task is to uh, separate the, um, the actual sequence into a set of what we call tokens, so units that can be processed. So it can arise at different levels, at the level of the beats, of the words, of the sentence, of, uh, sometimes at the level of documents on others. And the general, uh, the broad idea of the, this network is to have like a set of layers, so neural networks, again, that measure the, 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 uh, the implication, uh, like how do you say, the, uh, that measure the, uh, um, oh, geez, I'm losing my words. Uh, yeah, so I will draw, it, it will uh, come back to me. Correction. Yeah, thanks. So that would measure, measure the correlation between each of uh, the tokens. So uh, it's like uh, I report the token here also, and it will say, okay, so this, uh, this one, the I, is correlated to the uh, am, for example, etc., etc. So it measures this kind of uh, like interaction between the tokens. And firstly, it has been uh, introduced, uh, usually in deep learning, uh, from the history point of view, uh, usually the, the innovation comes from the image field. So with the convolutions or this kind of stuff. And uh, this time uh, in deep learning, when, when, when they introduced the transformer architecture, it has reversed uh, the, the process. So now the vision are taking inspiration uh, in the uh, language modeling uh, world. And so they have uh, like tried uh, to apply this, uh, this kind of architecture onto images. And the first question is, how do you tokenize images? And what they do usually is that they, they produce patches of the image. So uh, let's say this is a, an image, right, with a smiley face. And so what they do is that they, uh, they create those blob of images that can overlap. And they say that this is token two, this is token one, OK? And so then they use similar approaches in order to use it. And so if I rephrase the, the question, uh, it's uh, why did, didn't I, or maybe uh, what are my insights on, on using this kind of architecture for the task uh, that I, I'm currently solving? So um, actually, they, they are uh, actually work uh, on uh, using transformers for vision. For example, the vision, visual transformer. Um, and they also have been used uh, like in GAN architecture more recently. Uh, but this is uh, kind of harder to train. Uh, because like the convolutional aspect of the network makes it like really efficient. Uh, and on top of that, 
uh, more recently, like a few months ago, there, there is a paper that came out and that is actually using uh, the transformer in denoising diffusion models. So um, I did not took the time to explore the use of such kind of models because they are usually like huge and I'm limited by the computers. And it's more efficient to, to train a convolutional neural network. So this is the, the main reason why I didn't explore this uh, aspect. But uh, from the uh, today's standpoint, and with the uh, uh, advances in software and hardware uh, in terms of uh, efficiency of the compute, of the attention mechanism that is used in uh, transformers, uh, effectively, I could uh, explore this uh, area. And it has been shown that uh, most of the time, like, and actually it was most of the paper in, uh, I think, the last five years, were all about, okay, so we switched from this architecture to transformer and we improved uh, our results. So yeah, this is a, a good area, uh, a direction to go through. Yeah, so I hope I answered uh, your question. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for explaining, uh, summarizing what transformers uh, are at the sort of basic level. Uh, so it's clear that you understand uh, this type of architecture and where it comes from. Um, and it's correct that it's, it was designed first to, to deal with series of, of uh, signals, so uh, can be used also in sound music, etc. So uh, the reason I was thinking about these architectures mm -hmm. is that in, in the transformer type of architecture, there's this notion of uh, attention. Yeah. Uh, so par part of the architecture is actually uh, highlighting areas of interest, so whether it's uh, particular words, how they relate, or in images, it would be uh, areas as of where you have uh, features that keep reoccurring yep. uh, together with other features, uh, and that becomes part of the training set in the so-called Latin space, uh, high-dimensional space. Yeah. So uh, I was thinking of the architecture because I it, it seemed to me that uh, when you I think it's in Stencil Torch when you have this notion mask. of masks. Yeah. In a way, I mean, this is a very discrete and uh, sort of more formalized uh, type of uh, attention, if you mm -hmm. want. Yeah. But I was wondering whether there, uh, that, that was sort of the relationship I could see that there may be uh, um, uh, um, uh, such a, a different architecture could perhaps uh, yeah. implicitly capture this notion that yeah. you're making explicit. And uh, actually, what, what, do you what do you think? Does that make any sense? Yeah, th that, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, maybe I, I didn't take the time to dive into the architecture of the denoising diffusion uh, model. So I will just uh, uh, go back to the slides. So uh, here is the model. Uh -huh. Up, here it is. So uh, here, the, this is actually a cell, a, yeah, cell as a convolutional neural network. But in fact, if I dissect uh, the network down, in between those convolutional neural networks, they are uh, like actually attention uh, mechanism. And basically like something like, uh, I don't know if you, you are aware about that, but uh, this mechanism that is called uh, cross uh, self attention. So the, this is measuring the attention between uh, like the inner layers, but also something that is a signal that is external. And so this is why, uh, this is actually how they are able now to condition such models on other inputs. They are uh, leveraging this mechanism of attention uh, to do so. And also, I, uh, I should have the, took the time to uh, talk about this uh, during the presentation, but there is uh, one advantage of the denoising diffusion uh, model, is that it, uh, by doing uh, one type of training, so we train for image generation, and at the end, it can be exploited in different ways. We can generate images from scratch, using guidance or not, but we can also uh, like noise the image a little bit, so do a little bit of forward uh, diffusion, and then we can start from this point and the noise back, and so we can generate variations. And this way, we can also, like for example, only generate portions of the image. So it comes with in painting and out painting out of the box, and this is uh, partially due uh, to the attention uh, mechanism that you're talking about. Okay, thanks. So. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot to explore there. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, I would say attention is a mechanism uh, uh, studied for decades in the, the, the area of cognitive science and perception, yeah. in vision in particular. Uh, and there's uh, just a hint for you, I guess, maybe you're already aware, but there's lots of uh, interesting uh, literature from that field that uh, could be considered. 
for future research. Um, yep. Thanks. So actually, this leads me to a, a second set of uh, comments. So it's this discussion we just had on metrics and how to evaluate the quality of the work and compare it. So at the moment, uh, which is uh, what is usually done in, in the computer science area, in particular in machine learning, mm -hmm. you're using uh, metrics uh, that are uh, used by others. And uh, they are computational, obviously, and relatively simple. Uh, and I, I think uh, it's, it's quite a struggle to answer the, the questions you get, because as mentioned a few times, uh, ideally, the metrics uh, should lean towards the subjective yeah. uh, area. So, uh, have you had the chance? Or have you have you been able to look at uh, metrics coming from uh, different different fields that could relate to your application area? Which uh, so I was thinking again uh, the area of psychology or um, the area of visual art itself. Yeah, I, I won't lie, I haven't. Um, but I, I'm aware that because uh, in uh, our lab, some other people are working on other subjects such as uh, human machine interaction or such kind of things. Uh, they are more uh, used to uh, the kind of evaluation that are subjective and that are done by, uh, with the uh, users, actually. And um, I did not invest too much time in it, and I should maybe have, uh, because it is costly to scale. And so I wanted to move fast to cope with the, the pace of the, the field. But uh, yeah, I should definitely uh, look into that uh, for future work. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking it's not necessarily that you you do the, the work yourself, but uh, in collaboration, uh, but also just be aware a bit of the literature that exists and, and yeah. have ideas about where to go next, basically. Yeah. Um, so. I, I'd be curious myself of what kind of uh, feedback you would get from the, the world of art and practicing artists in, in, the, in the domain you're targeting. Yeah. Is that, were you able to actually have people, uh, professionals or people who actually okay. work in the field, comment on, explore your, your, your systems and, and, and give us some feedback, early feedback? Yeah, so I can give you some insight on that. So firstly, I consider myself as a self-taught artist. So I have the capacity to uh, like il do illustration both in 2D and 3D. And I'm, uh, I master like Blender, Photoshop and uh, whatnot. And so uh, I've tried it myself in my own work. And secondly, uh, there is actually an active community of artists that are using uh, those kind of uh, 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 methods in order to explore them. So they, they are, they, there is insight in uh, those areas. And so I've, uh, most of the time it's in the form of forums. So for example, on Reddit or, or Twitter or these kind of things. And there is actually an issue is that uh, since the uh, revolution of stable diffusion and such kind of model, there is actually a, a kind of backlash uh, for uh, um, like automatic methods, even though there is interaction. And so usually it's hard to find artists that accept to, uh, to use uh, such method nowadays. Because it, uh, actually, if I have to sum up their point of view, uh, we are actually stealing their work in order to train such network, right? And so uh, it's, it may be great in uh, uh, like research areas or something because we are not exploiting uh, financially, uh, financially those metrics. But because the uh, uh, industry is actually uh, taking advantage of it, uh, there is uh, this uh, like reticence, uh, let's say. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Sense. So okay. we, it's good to bring that, that, that subject, I think, on the floor. Uh, yeah. So as a, an academic or a researcher, I think we have a responsibility to um, face these issues with respect to the public. And actually, yeah. uh, the comment was made already uh, about the conclusion could be extended. And I thought, uh, in my notes uh, about the conclusion that that was one aspect you, you, you could perhaps develop a little bit more yes. in the conclusion part. Uh, that is uh, w what's happening in artistic communities, what kind of impacts this can have, and uh, uh, perhaps your thoughts on how to um, introduce such techniques so, okay. uh, so that they are more acceptable or seen as at least interesting. Um, so you, yeah. you're, you have the focus from the start that you're aiming at uh, col collaborative modes, human-machine, 
so I think that's always something to bring forward when you talk to uh, artists, yeah. the, the artistic community, um, and make clear that uh, it is only by collaborating with them that you can turn these uh, systems and tools in, uh, yes. in ways that are useful to them, yeah. rather than seen as a, as a, as a threat. So on the, on the topic of collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, I have a few things. Um, so in, in an area that I work on, uh, uh, computer games, uh, we have this uh, term called mixed initiatives or initiatives in English, okay. um, which I, I think you should look into if you're not familiar with. But essentially, the objective is, is uh, exactly how to make uh, tools for generating uh, what's called assets in, in the computer game jar jargon, essentially anything that is useful to okay. uh, a game world, uh, such that the, the systems are um, controllable by the artist uh, or the designer or the, the person who's uh, using the system. So this is, I think, the same objective that you have set from yeah. the start. Uh, and perhaps you could relate to that literature in computer game area as well. Uh, and I think the, okay. the kind of systems you, de you develop are relevant to the computer game Thank you for uh, the insight. Indus I just note. <laughs> industry. Uh, and they definitely have the same concerns uh, about, uh, they, have, they employ large communities of artists and uh, the same worries are, are there. So I think developing these tools in that context uh, is key. Um, yeah, so something to look up, I guess. Uh, more of a compliment. Okay. Uh, so let me see. Uh, okay, I'm picking up on a topic. Uh, you may have uh, detailed it in the presentation on, on page 89 of the version of these I had. You talk about hint maps, and these are produced by hand, I believe. Yes. Could you give us uh, details on uh, the, the user interface, uh, how it works, uh, what kind of hints, and what, what what's their sort of a structure, or okay. uh, yeah, yeah what, what are they, um, or any limitations, perhaps? So I'm not sure this is uh, still uh, deployed, uh, paint storage, because uh, actually, because of the backslash, I removed the, the actual uh, online demonstration. So just let me take a, a look at this. Uh, paint stored. Uh, yeah. Okay. Paint stored, paint stored, paint stored. Up, this one, I think. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my bad. Talk, talk, talk. Use GitHub pages. Save changes. And here is the link. Okay, so this was the, uh, the actual first version. Um, and there is uh, the other one for Stencil Torch. And actually, I took inspiration from the uh, software that are used for um, like uh, art production, such as uh, Photoshop or whatnot. And so uh, the user provide a, a line art. So I, I won't demonstrate it uh, live because I'm not sure it's working uh, anymore. But uh, basically, the uh, uh, user inputs a line art. And so there are two canvases that appear on the screen. Uh, maybe I could take the, the video as a, an example. It would be easier. Um, yeah, so this one, here it is, yeah. Okay, so, um, so the, the user c um, comes up with a line art. So it is then uh, um, like displayed as two canvases, two separate ones, one for the inputs and one for, for the results. And so the user then uh, pick colors using uh, like a predefined brush sizes we could have gone with uh, unlimited sizes, but we have decided for a, a limited one, just for, a, like a, let's say, the sake of time, maybe. <laughs> and uh, so then the user uh, actually uh, choose the colors and can uh, draw them on the left canvas. So as we will see uh, in a few seconds. Up, come on. Yeah, like this. And so uh, basically at the software level, it is like a, there are two canvases that are uh, overlapping each other, one for displaying the line art, and one that captures the actual stroke uh, from the user. And uh, 
basically uh, our intent in that is that just to uh, let the user do like uh, strokes that just uh, describe where they want to colorize with uh, which color. And so the, uh, depending with real-time feedback on the uh, uh, right colorization, it can refine this uh, uh, positioning of the, the hints. So that, that it answer your uh, questions. Thank you. So, I, uh, so th this very type of interface, I think, is, is uh, the subject of uh, problems when you give a, a tool or a demo to practicing artists. Because the, the, the sort of input, the hint maps, uh, yeah. the sort of input you've designed, they're really thought from the point of view of automatization still. So, you, you know, you're basically giving an interface, which is sort of a childish way of giving minimum information. Yeah. And, and then uh, it would be good for a child. That's what I mean by childish, not that it's uh, a ridiculous. Yeah, I get your point. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the professional artists, well, you know, they, their pleasure is actually details and refinements. And here they're a bit forced to do to give very coarse information yeah. and, and then the details is done by the machine, which is almost the inverse of what, what the human would like to have. Um, so uh, just commenting on that, I think there, there, you know, there's something to explore and I'm not saying this is easy to do because most systems are, are thought by, uh, I guess, people in, in the computer science community and we, we tend to design these things and then yeah. test them with, with users rather than have the users uh, uh, design the interface uh, part. So uh, yeah, something to think about, but uh, I wanted to highlight that. I think there's, there's, there's lots you could explore. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me change my screens. But uh, thank you for uh, the, the pointing back to the video, that was clear. Um, another topic that uh, we talked about before, and I just want to re-emphasize, I think it's definitely of importance, is this um, process you've selected to yeah. generate uh, uh, lines from um, a particular technique of edge detection. and. There is, uh, def I mean, this is a huge area. For those who are unaware in the audience, uh, this is one of the oldest area of um, exploration in, in image processing or computer vision. Uh, so there's a lot and lots of techniques that could be uh, compared, but uh, in the last decade or two, in particular, there's been quite a bit of interesting work uh, in the computer graphics community by people who are more aware of how our, our artists um, highlight certain types of curves from a 3D object uh, and which are not easily characterized by traditional edge detection approaches. Yes. So I, th I think there would be interesting, uh, again, more of an extension of your work uh, uh, to look into these areas. So these are the, the work that I'm familiar with, which is in the last yeah, two decades or so, uh, including some recent ones, uh, uh, comes from the computer graphics community and, and they're not necessarily linked to deep learning yeah. per se. Uh, they're trying to really uh, recover the, 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 the particular lines that uh, artists tend Respect, to yeah. highlight from uh, the form they're considering. Yeah. And uh, it's not trivial because a human artist will not uh, follow uh, simply uh, contrast-based highlights. So basically edge detection yeah. is useful, but it doesn't give you all that is used by a, an artist. And also it gives you a lot of other things that artists reject. Yeah. Uh, so there, there is some interesting work there. I think it would be in the future, uh, probably you would have very different types of line art inputs from that those types of approach, and then it would be interesting to compare, to compare with those, uh, yeah. edge base. And, uh, so this was more of a comment, but okay. then on the edge base, edge edge uh, type of process are, mm -hmm. are are known to be sensitive to noise. Yeah, usually you have some notion of a threshold. Yeah. of some kind. Uh, so I don't remember the thesis that you really commented on um, 
on, on that aspect of, of such techniques. Could you tell us a little more about that? Like, yeah. does it, if you, if you uh, have an edge map, which is, which has more details or less details by changing its parameters yes. of, of the method, does that impact the end result a yeah. lot or not really? Yeah, uh, actually, I can give you uh, insight of, uh, on both comments. Uh, I, I will uh, start by the first one, taking inspiration yeah. from the computer graphic area in order to generate okay. like, uh, lines. Um, because I actually have interest in, uh, into this field. And uh, I've seen like recently there, there's actually a paper that came out uh, that used like, 3D models uh, and the aspects of uh, like, the mesh in order to select like, lines that would have been selected by artists. And also that, uh, for example, um, so let's uh, get back to the actual problem. So for example, if uh, I have a simple shape, so let's say this uh, simple circle, right? And so uh, most of the time, the artist does not uh, use a same, the same thickness to represent the shape. Uh, for example, one choice, one uh, choice that could be made, is that could, for example, let's say there is a light uh, coming from this direction and that's pointing at the sphere. Uh, they could, for example, uh, uh, decide to, uh, I'm not sure I can do it with uh, this software, but uh, for example, let's say uh, there will be, uh, sorry, Opacity, let's not that, this one. So for example, uh, they could uh, select the uh, outer region of the sphere. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And they would make the, the line thicker, thicker the uh, more they get away from the lighting. So we are looking from, uh, for such kind of behavior. Or for example, let's say we have uh, a fold on the cloth. Uh, and let's say it uh, resembles something like uh, this. They would actually emphasize the connection area by making, uh, by making it uh, more thicker in this uh, area. And so effectively, there are uh, uh, indeed techniques uh, in computer graphics that, that are uh, research looking for such kind of behavior. Um, and some are based on 3D models. So they exploit uh, a database of uh, 3D models uh, and they generate such kind of uh, outputs out of shaders using the lighting and uh, other behaviors. And uh, we can then, uh, like, um, based on that kind of uh, behavior, we can, uh, choose to go the path of neural networks, and so to train neural networks to come up with, a, the, the, to make the link between the uh, input and the output, so it can be applied uh, on other type of material, not necessarily 3D models. And we can also take the, 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 the path of uh, like a classical approaches where we exploit the, like for example, using tri triangulation uh, to select the areas or whatnot. And there are many other techniques, but here are some of the techniques that we could explore. And also there is, a, Another advantage of using 3D models, uh, models maybe as the basis uh, for the work is that we could exploit, for example, the normals that come from the uh, um, models in order to uh, like, uh, model, uh, model the lighting effects and uh, whatnot. Yeah, so this is like uh, some insight maybe on that part. And then concerning the uh, XDOG, that, so our, uh, we, we've selected an edge base uh, method that is called XDOG. It is basically uh, use, uh, measuring the difference between two Gaussians that are applied on the image. And the output is most of the time a little bit noisy. So uh, I think I took the time to uh, put an example in um, the actual PDF of the thesis. So I will uh, just go back to it. Uh, thesis up. Here it is. And so uh, I think it was at the beginning of the contributions maybe. Uh, uh, so this is, no, this is convolutional neural network. So, mm -mm, beginning of contributions here, yeah. Okay, here we go. Oh. Hello? Sorry, we have a... Allô? Can you hear me? Tu peux baisser peut-être un peu le... Ouais. Thank you, sorry. Allô? C'est bon? Ok, it's good. Maybe it's a little bit lower. Thanks. Ok, so maybe I will uh, talk uh, not louder. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, here is some visualization of the XDOG uh, when applied uh, to uh, an image. And actually, um, I would like to emphasize the fact that we are not uh, uh, applying this method on photographs, but on uh, like artistic illustrations that come from a genre that is called uh, anime color, uh, uh, illustrations. So they are often simplified. 
So there is not as much high frequency detail uh, in the MAD outcomes. So there is no, uh, not uh, that we do not uh, see this kind of uh, noisy outputs in the generation. So it is a uh, lesson. But uh, here are some, uh, so the x -dog actually have, uh, like I said, of uh, four parameters, and we can modify them. And basically it is, for example, the distance that we apply between the two Gaussians, like the power of the Gaussians, but also the threshold that we, we can be used to binarize the, the image. And there's a lot of uh, ways we can do that. And effectively, when we are using it on high frequency detail, it comes, down with, it comes up with uh, noisy outputs, but most of them can be uh, cleaned using thresholds. And again, uh, as you maybe uh, imply, uh, we have to tune those thresholds. So what I did is that uh, I've selected like, a few samples randomly from the data set that exhibit different behaviors. And actually, uh, to select them, I've used the, the same metric that I used to automatize the filtering. So I could verify on both like complex uh, inputs, more uh, like simple ones, one in black and white with more colors, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I manually uh, to, uh, visualized the differences uh, with those parameters and I actually picked a range that is interesting. And to cope with the fact that there is noise uh, maybe in the output, actually, and this is why I've picked also this technique because it is fast to compute. And actually the, the line arts are generated during training. So they are not pre-generated. And this allows us to uh, like select a range of those parameters. And each time we want a sample, we pick one of those randomly, and we train our network on that. And because we are uh, training on a lot of samples, those errors will, be, will average, let's say. So it will, be like, it will learn to cope with this. And this is why maybe uh, we've tested, uh, actually, um, we did a workshop with uh, students that used uh, our model. And they applied it to other stuff, even though it was trained only for anime line authorization. They use it, for example, for ar architectural uh, design and uh, colorization uh, and other stuff. And actually, the network was able to cope with the, the different inputs really well. And I think, from my point of view, this is due to the fact that during training, we are uh, allowing these uh, like, uh, differences for the liners. So I hope uh, it answers your question. Yes, thank you. I think this this is useful, uh, definitely useful, um, and it it shows also that the the work can be uh, generalized. Um, okay, so I, I'm I'm reaching the end of of my questions and comments. I I just have some sort of more generic comments. Uh, they're not very that 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 crucial, but I just wanted to to mention a few things. Uh, so let me just look at them. Uh, just a second. Uh, okay, so uh, this this is not uh, really critique on the work at all. It's just uh, general comments. Uh, you write on page eighty uh, a comment that is often mentioned in in the computer science communities. Uh, so I'll just quote to you these layers. You're talking of uh, machine learning or deep learning yeah. networks, neural networks. These layers are closer to output neurons focusing on object representation. And then next sentence, consequently, they imitate the way humans judge similarities between humans, uh, between images, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, uh, you know, I think you'll get a lot of criticism if you write this or mention this it is too talking bold, yeah. to people in psychology or even visual art, etc. Yeah. Uh, it or even uh, you know to some extent in computer science, but uh, we we don't really understand how the the human uh, neural system functions uh, for uh, in relation to perceptions. Uh, we understand a little bit, but not that much. Uh, so to say anything like uh, these artificial neural networks imitate the way humans judge similarities is a uh, really uh, a guess, uh, yeah, right? It's Rather too strong, than, uh, like an overstatement, right? Yeah, it's it's too strong. But but it's you know I, I'm I'm mentioning this because a lot of people, well, a lot of people, some people, including some well-known people, will make these statements, and then you know you come as a younger fellow and you sort of follow the the what the sort of senior people say. So just be careful because in, in, in other fields related to human intelligence, studying human intelligence in general, uh, 
this will be seen as you know this sort of a free opinion and okay. there's really no, no uh, reason to believe it at the moment because we don't have the science for it so i, I will uh, so this tune just, down uh, this uh, in the final effect. yeah it's just a comment it, it's written in my uh, preliminary report as well which i think you can yeah. have access to uh and then uh, just a historical note because i i noticed that you mentioned a few times at the beginning of the, the presentation so you 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 referred and and this is good uh, that you referred to past work and the, the origin of neural networks uh goes a long way uh all the way to even uh before we really start seeing uh, real computers being made uh, by, by that i mean computers yeah. that are uh made of electro uh, electronics uh, so you mentioned Rosenblatt, uh, but it's actually the origin of, of the neural uh, perceptron is work from Maculo and Pitts. I don't know if you're familiar with it, yeah. which dates from a decade before. So you, you could, you know, in terms of historical background, you, you could also relate all the way back to, to that uh, crucial okay. work. Rosenblatt is really a, a slight improvement on, on the design of the perceptron by Maculo and Pitts. Uh, so yes, just wanted to mention that. And yep. another thing you could uh, mention uh, in the background is the origin of uh, the gradient descent technique applied to neural networks. So this is work, I uh, actually forget the name now, but it's from the early to mid 1970s yeah. uh, that it was published. And I think if you, you know, if you make these statements, it's good to put them together, but because again, in the community, there's a lot of tendency to say that all of this is very recent and all the, the, the contributions of neural networks related to gradient descent, for example, dates from the 1980s, 1990s, which is incorrect. So uh, let, let's, let's give uh, to Cesar what uh, Cesar owns. So thanks a lot. I think this is a great piece of work and uh, I'm done with my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. So it's now the time to my neighbor to, to have uh, the possibility to ask questions. Okay. was this was quite a lovely presentation and I did read the thesis through and you know it's very insightful and since many of the questions have been asked already right I just want to focus on a few details so you know in your first design of paint torch and you actually showed how the messy filling problem and especially yeah. the gradient problem is solved yeah. Can you explain to me the mathematical reason, or you know, at least speculate on the mathematical reason why the solution, why your model solves this problem so well? Okay, yeah, I can speculate on that, yeah. So I cannot give you a full insight, but uh, I can try. Okay, okay. so firstly, um, those uh, problems that are quite simple are also re related to another pr problem, that is the artifacts problem. And uh, I did not show this here, but actually this problem that I mentioned at the very end uh, that is quite similar, but at the time different, uh, this problem. It, it is referred often as the checkerboard uh, artifact, right? And this is partially due to the fact that we are uh, like relying on convolutions for the model. And because we, are, we have these uh, like window filters that uh, like move onto the image, uh, and uh, in a predefined pattern, actually, it is uh, coming up with that. And one of the things that uh, has made uh, our work less prevalent to this kind of uh, problem is, uh, actually I didn't have time to talk about it, but uh, I will zoom into it. This particular uh, piece of work, like the pixel shuffle block. So what they propose to do, that when, where we are working on uh, feature space, so ba basically the features in a uh, convolutional neural network are layered on top of each other. And so the more we go deep into the network, the more uh, layers there is. And so um, this work proposed to actually mix the pixel in a certain way that we and each time on each block sorry come on so on every block it will be this pattern will be different so it will actually uh, entangle the way the network is uh, finding paths uh, into the image and actually uh, why this is 
like uh, appearing still in our work. And I, I, I may, maybe I didn't pay uh, too much attention when I said it, but it arises in our work in particular settings, not always, when we are using uh, highly saturated uh, colors. And this is partially due, and certainly this is my guess, uh, because in the images that we are using for training, highly saturated uh, colors are not picked in nature, right? And so this is partially why. Yeah. This is my guess. question, which is uh, where you say that the diffusion models yeah. will do better than GANs yeah. in this. Can you justify that? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe, uh, again, this is maybe uh, like a bold statement, but yeah. So, um, like current work on the, the diffusion uh, models, and particularly this one. So, uh, maybe I need to zoom down. Yeah, this one from uh, uh, Dariwal uh, and Al here. They have uh, evaluated this method on like a lot of benchmarks on the, uh, of image generation, and they have shown that uh, on those benchmarks, the uh, DDPM is beating the, the actual GAN model. But that does that, don't, the, that doesn't mean that the GAN will be uh, like left out. There is still research in the area to improve it. But this is a promising uh, approach to go uh, through, and um, yeah, and moreover, this is uh, something by design also because. Like the diffusion uh, model compared to the GAN model is an re autoregressive model. So it has time to refine the output, whereas the GAN doesn't have this time. And also, um, I skipped over it because I didn't have the time to present it. But uh, uh, usually when we present architecture for image generation, we go through like a set of uh, historical paths. There is the autoencoder that was uh, like introduced like back uh, like before the 18th and this kind of stuff. It was uh, like a really old idea. And then it was extended uh, as variations. So, and one of these variations is the variational autoencoder. So it, uh, it models the, this latent code, this time not as a frequentist approach, like as one static statistical variable that answered the problem, but it models it as a distribution. And so instead of finding Z, we also have the mu and the sigma and the normal uh, and whatnot, yeah. And so uh, with this approach, we model the distribution in this latent space. So we are able to cover a lot more of uh, uh, the area. There is actually one catch with uh, this approach, is that uh, when we are using, uh, like things in nature are not necessarily conti continuous, right? And so for example, in the case of uh, like image generation, when we are generating, let's take a simple example where we want to generate uh, handwritten digits, okay? There is a fixed set of digits, right? And there is like one, uh, uh, let's say, adopted way of writing certain digits, right? So it late, in later space, uh, it, it is not uh, really essential to come up with a, like a lot of variety in the position of the, these numbers, right? It, they could be clustered in a special area, and that could be enough. And so there is an extension of this work that is called the VQ VAE, and that quantized this latent space to make those like really separate and like really clustered. And the way they are doing it is that they are quantizing this latent space to really set a, a predefined set of features. And then they are in, uh, doing interpolation in this space. And the real good thing about the uh, VAE is that you can interpolate easily and quite naturally uh, between the image samples. So the VAE uh, makes you uh, able to generate a variety with the same input and uh, to explore this latent space in more semantic uh, manner. And so why I'm talking about this? is because the uh, actual uh, architecture of the diffusion, uh, yeah, it is not written here, but uh, this uh, unit last uh, here. Actually, it can be viewed as a succession of those uh, VAEs. Do you see what I, I mean? So then I, I would have yeah. one question. Do you think that in a quantized space, you would be able to infuse language-driven corrections yeah. right, much better? Yeah. Because now it is quantized and you can... <laughs> You feel that the language-based interpolation would work better in the quantized space because the classes are much more clearly separated? Yeah, yeah because uh, this, way, uh, okay. <laughs> this way, you just have to, uh, like, it's, it's like if you uh, give a people, uh, so someone who doesn't know La Défense, and you say, it, uh, go to the, the actual th uh, term, or you say, okay, go to this area. If you are more precise, this is easier, right? And so because of the, those principles, yeah, I, I think it could apply in this, uh, this space. And actually, this is why um, 
most of the work of the uh, diffusion models are conditioned on text. And they are actually, uh, in reality, they are training an embedding. So again, another latent space that is uh, specialized for text, and they are aligning the uh, aligning. latent space. Yeah. So if it's discrete, it is easier to uh, align in certain ways. Yeah. This is my guess. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you. It's my turn. So congratulations for the presentation. It thank was you. very interesting and dy dynamic way. It's very, very, uh, very interesting. So I have uh, one, or maybe two questions. Okay. Because uh, many questions were, <laughs> were posed before. Uh, in this slide, you talk about semantic map. Could you give more? Uh, uh, more okay. information about the use of this semantic map um, and also what kind of those representation? Ones? Like uh, those ones? No, no, no. The, oh, no, the, the this one, one in a, a, f a 51 a slide. Yeah. 51 slide. Here? The one you, you talk uh, on the right, conditioning ah, okay. semantic map. Yeah. What is for you a semantic map? Um, conditioning on semantic map. Okay, yeah. So um, these are. Uh, Maybe I could, uh, if you allow me to look at another, oh, I remove this. Um, Gauguin, yeah. So just a few seconds, Gauguin, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, images, yeah, nice. So these are what we call, we refer to as semantic map in the field. So these are images and each color represents uh, semantic information. For example, here, uh, there is the, um, the actual uh, cascade, then there is the uh, grass and other type of stuff. So the semantic map are images that for each pixel, we assign a color to a class of objects. And these are what they call a semantic map, in the, at least in the field. And for what representations? Uh, representations. Uh, okay, so this is a schematic that is, uh, uh, that's com comes from the work on the latent diffusion models. Mm -hmm. So this is not, not uh, my work. Okay, so just to emphasize that. And uh, by representation, they mean that the, you can use like, any latent space representation to condition the network. So it means that by using, so both, uh, like all the, those boxes that are on the far right, so for those who are online here on the conditioning side, uh, they are actually, uh, they can be like raw inputs, images, text, and, and whatnot, but they can also be uh, like uh, neural networks or other type of processes that give us an input that can be used to condition the model. And so by representation, they, uh, they make references to this latent space. And the latent space are basically just those compressed space uh, that has been learned for a specific type of input. Yeah. Okay, I think I see what uh, you mean. Uh, in, in certain situations, I wonder if you could take into account the context. To what? Uh, the context, okay. the, the intentions of uh, the user, he wants to color uh, yeah. uh, a shape or uh, an image, and maybe he could uh, propose to, to create uh, an a mood, a Christmas mood, or uh, why yeah. not another one? How we could do that with, with that? your work? Yeah, so uh, actually this is one of the aspects we want to explore. Uh, and I briefly talked about uh, in the uh, yeah, extensions. And uh, uh, these are the additional controls that we could allow in this work. And one, uh, there are multiple aspects that we could allow. First, in our data set, as I said, we filtered for some uh, given art style, let's say. But we could also have gone the path of uh, like embedding those styles into specific uh, neural, uh, uh, specific vectors that we can condition the network on. So at runtime, we could like select the style that we want to apply, and it c this can be extended to a mood. Uh, to uh, for example, let's say we want to generate landscapes. It can be also be uh, like the setting: is it night? Is it is it, is it day? Winter? Summer? And what else? And this is a general way of conditioning those networks, but depending on the uh, actual latent representation that we are conditioning on, the task is easy or not. Because the network has come up with a, like a disentanglement of the space. So it has to uh, demily uh, the, the space, yeah. Uh, depending on, on the evaluation of yeah. the user, he could say, yes, uh, I agree, I'm satisfied, or not, and how could you uh, 
uh, give elements to to your uh, to your tools to to ev to modify the color, the, the mood, uh, and so on. Maybe more uh, dark, uh, less uh, light. Uh, I don't know. Okay, so about well, if for example we use text as the conditioning, it is as simple as using natural language. So you would say the model. Okay, so this is a scene uh, in the dark, in the snow, and it would like uh, use those words. And actually, this is a uh, like you may have heard of uh, stable diffusion, maybe? No? Yeah? Okay, so basically this is what uh, stable diffusion is doing. Uh, this is the exact same model, now with uh, improvements, because the field is moving like really fast. But basically they are uh, conditioning on a, a text embedding that allows them to uh, announce what do they want to generate in text form. And so this way you can condition it. But you could also, for example, if you have a labeled data set that comes up with an image, for example, let's say dark versus light, uh, you could label th those images and use this label in order to condition the network. There are many ways to, to do it, yeah. Thank you very much. You're so, uh, I will uh, give the talk to your supervisor, and I think the first one uh, will be Francis Rousseau. Okay. Clément est parti. Thank you, Marie-Hélène. Thank you, Mrs. President. I'm very happy because, uh, well, uh, Five or six years ago, we decided with, with Clément to better collaborate, and that gave birth to, to two uh, brilliant thesis and a research investigation. First one was presented by Gregor two, two weeks ago, and, and now by Ilyes, and I'm always fascinated when I'm hearing Ilyes. Maybe I abused a lot because I invited many times to present uh, work uh, towards uh, in front of students because He's got something like a very good pedagogy. We all have appreciated that. And also, um, it, it was very interesting. Of course, the discussion was very interesting because some, something is missing is, is that word, is that the generalization. I mean, there are many axes, many potential uh, generalization axes. And of course, it's very difficult to, 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 to describe all that. And during the discussion, we, we have now, maybe a better view on how important that, that work is in terms of a potential generalization towards creativity, um, because for the make, making a draw on coloric, uh, trying to colorize, it's uh, something like uh, it can be applied in many other fields, maybe. Uh, for example, the Frederick mentioned video games. But of, of course, um, for example, I'm more familiar uh, on, on music fields and music creativity. And music could also be uh, approached like that. You make a melody, and then you have to 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 have to harmonize the melody. So there are many many generalization um, that could be uh, uh, examined in that in that work. So. Uh, this could be great if you, I don't know what is your, really your project now, but that, that is a good, very good beginning to, to try to, to, to generalize and at least to make a, 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 one fantastic thing should be to, to, to give us a cartography or on the, the, the potentialities of your work. Many of us put the accent of the, the let's say, the weakness of the conclusion, but it could be there. How can that be? Uh, generalized in many uh, ways. Of course, it's not easy. Most of the discussion uh, that took place turned ar around that point. So uh, I encourage you to, of course, to continue working because it's very important what you what you have done. But also to yeah to maybe in collaboration to try to to map the the potentiality of uh, what you have done. But I'm very happy as I told you, and uh, I wanted to congratulate you. <laughs> It was a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So um, please, uh, Marie Elaine, you can uh, talk again the, the management of the, of the presentation, of the defense. Okay. Thank, thank you, Francis. So now I will give the talk to Florent Nolo. Thank you. I'm very enjoy working with, with you, Elias. You, uh, I'm sorry uh, not to be with you, but uh, you know <laughs> the, the reason. It's complicated. So, uh, but obviously, I have no question. Just congratulations. 
Uh, you are uh, an excellent student and you did an excellent job. Uh, it's uh, a very, very difficult subject. And it was a, a real pleasure to, to work with you and Francis and, uh, and Clément. Uh, but uh, there is a, there was, or there is a but. The main problem of Ilias, uh, he speaks very, very, very quickly in English. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, actually, the, this is due to the stress. Like when I, I got, <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> my bad. Yeah, but uh, it's just a joke. Uh, congratulations again. Thank I'm, you. I'm uh, happy to to directed this uh, this work. Thank you. The pleasure is shared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Florent. Now it's time to give uh, the talk to Clément. Clément Duart, please. Thank you. So, Ilyas, uh, I think uh, as part of the jury and supervisor, we are not allowed to, to, to speak about you during the um, committee. So I will give a testimony for all the committee to know who is Ilyas, uh, by the way. Because uh, behind all of this amazing presentation and very challenging work, uh, and I want to highlight challenge because Ilyas always loves challenge, even when his supervisor highly recommend him. Maybe it's super tough. In front of you, you have 10 guys from Google, 10 other from Meta, and so to want to, to, to beat this guy at their own game, it's uh, quite challenging. So that's also, as a supervisor, something that I, I learned uh, today, that sometimes we should be more um, um, convincing. But yes, yeah, you did a, a very uh, amazing pedagogical uh, presentation. Uh, you are a teacher for the last four years. Uh, your courses about deep learning are very, very appreciated. Uh, all students already have a very kind word for you, uh, for your uh, availability, your advice, uh, your strong, very strong technical and theoretical background. Uh, and at some point you are even doing a, a MOOC about deep learning at the university, so that's something that we should uh, highlight. So we plan to publish it next September, I think, which is composed of a set of uh, brick for deep learning technology, uh, which is quite a new kind of MOOC, which usually are more oriented about how to do something. This one is more focused on how to learn everything, uh, which is uh, very in our uh, IFT uh, um, roots. Um, so uh, I have to highlight that Ilyas is also the second student uh, from the DVIC. So he was at the very, very begi beginning of this um, adventure. Now we are IFT, we are like 120 students, 15 PhD, 20 staff, but at the very beginning we was almost three of us. <laughs> and so it's a kind of um, so you are also adventurer because you take the risk to do a PhD in a very uh, emergent structure. Um, you love the, the, the risk and uh, because you are very confident about your ability of to work because you are a very strong worker, uh, definitely very smart. At the very beginning of your thesis, I figured out that I will not be able to follow all of your equation, uh, but I trust you to, uh, to uh, on your own. Uh, on your skills, and so I just want to, to say, yeah, you are very passionate, uh, very kind person, uh, always smiling and available, and I'm very proud to, to be able to work with you uh, during these last uh, four years, and uh, be happy to be a future lad. Congrats for everything and all coming soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I think it's time uh, for the deliberation. Yeah. So. so in my office with my laptop. Uh, so, Gregor, can you just uh, set the sound here? You, you may let open the. Je pense qu'on peut pas en français, y a pas de souci. Hein. Tu peux juste euh, éteindre le, le, le zoom là, pour pas qu'on voit, pour ouais. qu'on connecte. Enfin, tu fermes l'écran quoi, et tu coupes le son ici pour ton centre confidentiel et on revient tous. Ok. Ici après pour donner la, la délibération. Pas de ok. C'est mine fin. Ce qu'ils vont faire, c'est qu'ils vont passer dans une autre salle. Et vous, donc vous restez sur ce zoom-là, nous on va le quitter et vous serez du coup en, en autonomie entre vous. Voilà. Donc euh, merci d'avoir été présent pour, pour ma thèse et pour vos, vos directions futures et vos questions. Merci beaucoup.
Hop. Tu peux laisser le, la présentation Parce qu'après, j'ai un pour les remerciements.